Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. We're supposed to talk on Step 12 tonight, and um, which has a lot to do with making anniversaries in Alcoholics Anonymous to show that Alcoholics Anonymous works. And uh, we get this uh, out of the gift of desperation, and we get this out of having teachers put in our path, whether it's in a professional community we go to treatment and things like that, or uh, more even important than that, when we show up the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, the people who are going to carry the message to us. It's one part of our legacy, the three, three legacies that we offer here. And it's service, and, and comes of age is the basic service AA provides is one alcoholic working with another. And uh, when we lose uh, working with an alcoholic, uh, one drunk working with another, and, uh, and I don't mean just sitting down and dining or talking and, and hanging out, there's different ways we sponsor, but primarily taking someone methodically through the 12 steps and pass on the spiritual transformation. When we lose that in Alcoholics Anonymous, we don't have Alcoholics Anonymous. And so one of the things we can talk about uh, is sponsorship and what that looks like according to our book. And uh, you know, there's different ways people sponsor. There's different influences with the big book and the steps, but we ought to be giving away the steps. Sponsorship is not taking someone to a meeting and calling them. Uh, taking someone to a meeting is hopefully taking someone to a message is going to be conveyed, but um, it is in car service. Sponsorship is primarily passing on the message from the big book that hopefully the sponsor has had. And that's what they did at the beginning. It's vital to our existence. It's vital to my recovery. It's vital to every drunk's recovery. And often in the big book, it talks about passing the message on, giving it away to, to survive the certain trials and low spots ahead, Bill says. The foundation stone of recovery is one drunk or another. And over and over and over again, Dr. Bob said it simmers down to two things, love and service, service, working with the drunk. And not only the 12 steps, but once we teach them the steps, it's about teaching them meeting etiquette. When I see people texting at a meeting, I know their sponsor isn't really doing their job or they don't have one, or cross-talking, or, or smoking where they're not supposed to be smoking. Good sponsorship would straighten that out in two seconds. And then sometimes we claim to have a sponsor, but we never call them. So we don't have a sponsor. And I will tell you from my own experience, if your sponsor is not doing his job or her job, get another sponsor because your life depends upon the message they're passing on to you. Right? So sponsorships are re really important. And often when I go into a group, and I'll take inventory, I go into a group and I see a group off the chain, what I'm looking for is the elders in that group and the people that are sponsoring that group. I can never blame a newcomer for behaving inappropriately at a meeting. They don't know any better. So we always have to look at who the elders in the group, who the sponsors in the group. And how are they teaching? This is, this is vital to our existence. And uh, sometimes treatment centers have destroyed what sponsorship is supposed to look like. Because most of them don't have a clue. And so they come in, and there's articles written about this where they say that people go apparently through the steps in treatment, and they really don't. And they come into Alcoholics Anonymous, and they're, or Narcotics Anonymous, or, or Cocaine Anonymous, and they're told, find a sponsor, someone you can identify with. That's not sponsorship. If you're in AME, you should identify with anyone. Someone you can relate to. That's self-help and group therapy. Sometimes our sponsors are people we don't even like. But what, we, what they have is a message that they can pass on. And a sponsor ought not be your friend. Is that someone you're going to be a bud with and hang out because you need a teacher and a student? And that's the way it was brought up in Alcoholics Anonymous. There's some interesting information right in the beginning of working with others, our 12 step in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. And it, it says this, practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. Ensure immunity from drinking. Intensive work means I'm sitting down with my alcoholic and I'm working with them. <coughs> We're not just chit-chatting. I'm not calling a sponsor when it hits the fan because I'm in a little bit of a jam. I have a relationship with this man or woman, men with the women, men, women with the women, and they're working with me. It works when other activities fail. This is our 12 suggestion. Carry this message to other alcoholics. Now it tells us that we can help when no one else can. We can secure that confidence when others fail, and that includes the professional community because we talk each other's language. We can go to a meeting tonight in Montana, walk in, and we have a common denominator that's called alcoholism. 
And even though we never met, we all know each other. I travel a lot. I was away this weekend. I knew about 20 guys there. The other 100, I had no clue what they were, but we all knew each other. Alcoholics, we know it. We know the struggles, we know the fear, we know the insecurities, we know all, we know it. Then it tells me, remember they are very ill. And so when I see someone behaving inappropriately and they're new, what else do I expect? Because I wasn't the poster child for AA when I got here either, but I had drill sergeants showing me the way. For example, I remember I was new and I was just back to Brooklyn, uh, coming home from Minnesota, and I was just coming up on a year, and my, my home group had what we call the business meeting, the group conscious meeting. And I said, that's not for me, that's for the old timers, and I went home. That meeting started at 8.30, ended at 9.30, around quarter to 10, my phone rang. I said hello, and my sponsor used every four-letter word in, in the book for the next 20 minutes about my lack of responsibility to the home group. I never missed the home group. Over 10 years, I missed two business meetings, and that's because I had two surgeries. Over 10 years, never missed a business meeting. It's my home, my home group. It says, life will take on new meaning. To watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. We know you will not want to miss it. Frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is the bright spot of our life. Am I meeting with new people and offering sponsorship? Am I making myself available for sponsorship by carrying this message? When I came into Alcoholics Anonymous uh, in 1988, um, I was living in Minnesota, and there were great power of example walking around at one meeting in particular called the Three Legacies meeting. And they didn't jam the big book down my throat. They didn't tell me what to do, but they made themselves available. Now, it's really important, you know, when you knew you'd taken everyone's inventory, and I watched the way they walked, not only in the meetings, but outside the meetings, what their behavior was like, who were the 13-steppers, who were the womanizers, and who were sober gentlemen. And I watched the men who walked the walk outside of the meetings, Alcoholics Anonymous, and they were all in. They were journeymen in Alcoholics Anonymous, and they taught me. They taught me about the importance of literature, of service, of fellowship of living this life, not just using it as a quick fix. This has to be your life, they told me. And those very same men would take me to a diner when I had no money, and they would buy me dinner. It never made me feel embarrassed. They cared for me, because that's what they were made to do. And those are the same men that I went to for life lessons, and there was a gentleman out there who began to sponsor me. And he turned me on to cassette tapes. For you new people, there were cassettes before CDs. <laughs> and I learned about listening to other speakers. And they would take me to meetings and introduce me to the big book. And show me about shaking the speaker's hand when he or she was done. And meeting etiquette. Now, we didn't have cell phones back then, so that wasn't an issue. But we learned. And a lot of these teachers had no problem going eyeball to eyeball with you when you were out of order. I longed for those days when we had students and teachers. But they taught me, and they taught me about life in general, outside of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I began a journey to the big book. And uh, with about almost 11 months, I was brought home, and I was attracted to the men who were sure, who were drill sergeants, who would go up one side and down the other if I was out of order and tell me about meeting etiquette, tell me about thanking the speaker, on sharing. They told me about singleness of purpose. and went on and on and on. The importance of learning traditions and attending business meetings and being part of a home group. It gave me lessons even on how to socialize with people. These were my teachers, but they were all drill sergeants, and I was attracted to men like that who were sure they never wavered. They were sure on the message they were giving me. And I remember praying to God to uh, show me a teacher, a sponsor. And I would see a guy walk in with literature. He was a literature guy, and I thought maybe he was the principal of AA, and I was going to ask him, and I, I didn't. And then there was a guy chair in a meeting where he must be the boss of AA. should ask him, and something said, don't ask him. And then one night, I was at a, an anniversary meeting. This gentleman got up there and shared his experience with him hope at an anniversary, and that same voice says, go ask him. And I said, can you sponsor me? He said, I don't know. I'm a pain in the neck. And I knew that was the guy. At least before I sponsor you, you have to do a couple of things. And he showed me the big book where it says, we loan him a copy of this book. And on the second visit, having read the first portion, if he's prepared to go through the 12 proposals. And my, my would-be sponsor says, go home with the big book, read from the preface to page 164, and when you're done, call me. you got a few days to do it. 
And so that's what I did. I didn't know better. I had no wiggle room. There was no dating. There was no getting a car. I didn't have to worry about anything. This is it. And so I read the reading. Uh, I did the reading right away, and I called him up. He says, do you think you're an alcoholic? Your life's a mad. I said, yes. He says, you want help? I said, yes. You're willing to go to any lengths to get help? I said, yes. He's now I'll sponsor you. And little by little, began a journey through the big book from the cover, right from the title page. And he shared his experience, strength, and hope with me. And by the time I got to amends, I was ready to sponsor people because I had a transformation. And my job now was to pass it on, is what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I remember the first time I sponsored someone, I thought I was responsible for everything, getting them drunk, getting them sober. I became God right away. And I lost my first few on drunks. They just didn't call me, and I thought I was doing something wrong. And my sponsor, as long as you give this message away, you've done your part. Sponsorship is key. And sometimes I wonder about the type of sponsorship I hear and that what sponsors allow from the people they're sponsoring. You know, if my sponsor, if I'm not calling my sponsor regularly, I don't have a sponsor. And what I was told, I, get, I was given dates and times to call my sponsor. And I remember when I was new, it was Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. My sponsor gave me till 10 after 10. If I called at 10, 11, he wouldn't pick up the phone. That's how we did it. And I was disciplined to the spiritual life right away. Now, people do it different ways with different brands of sponsorship. I'm not here to compete or compare, but this is what I needed. I needed a drill sergeant. I need a disciplinarian to discipline me to the spiritual life because it was up to me. What do I know? I'll call when I'm in a jam. And I've heard some strange waves of sponsoring over the years in Alcoholics Anonymous. If I don't have a regular meeting with the sponsor, methodically going through the book and seeking life experiences and advice and direction, I don't have a sponsor. I have a sponsor in name only. Not that just ruffled half this room's feathers, right? That's just the way it is. That's what sponsorship is. Now, how do we get the name sponsor? Because when AA first started, you, in a sense, sponsored into the meeting. Nowadays, we walk in, have a desire to drink, welcome. Back then, they met in another room. And they huddled around. We got Joe here. What do you think? You want to bring him in? And I would say, yeah, I've been talking to the family. I think he has a real powerful desire to stop, an honest desire, as they called it back then. Okay, we'll vote. Let's bring him in. And he was my baby now. You didn't just walk and say, I'm here, give me a coin, I want to celebrate, give me my cake and the Academy Awards, and off we go. It was a whole different rhythm, because it was life and death. And now I'm in a treatment center industry, and to some degree, treatment centers have destroyed that. We have 90 Day Wonders in and out of AA. But back then, it was like detox in some place and coming here, rocking and rolling. Well, a lot of folks, and I remember this when I was coming around, that was 1988, 89, when I was in and out in, in the 80s, where people were detoxing right in the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And now we get all these ways of getting well, and none of them are working. That's why overall our numbers are so low in Alcoholics Anonymous. Sponsorship is key. It's one side of our triangle. Right? Recovery, unity, and service. And in in, in comes of ages is the basic service AA provides is one drunk work with another. That's key. One drunk work with another. Get someone to go work with. Get spiritual consent and go work with them. Sponsorship. And when we study our history, we learn what sponsorship was really all about. Um, I think it was Clarence Snyder was the guy who really, really introduced uh, what we know as sponsorship now. Because AA, after the Saturday Evening Post article came out, we had an influx of people by the thousands, and we didn't have enough members to handle all the people coming in. So had a kind of formalized sponsorship. How are we going to handle 200 coming in when we had 10 yesterday? So they would take a bunch and go work with them, and your job is get the message as quick as possible, go get another baby, bring him in, go work with them. There was no time to hang around. There was no such thing. And this is before my time. When you study our history, you learn about it. When we speak to old timers, we learn about it. There was no such thing as 90 meetings in 90 days. That has ripped apart AA. I'm working on my 90. What does that mean? There was no such thing as 90 meetings in 90 days. There weren't 90 meetings worldwide. They made a meeting a week back then, and the rest of the week they were working with drunks. You had a spiritual awakening, go get it, go to the detox, go to the hospital, go to salvation, go into, go on to the bowery, pull one in, which is what they were doing when you study comes of age. There was no time to hang around. No one had money to go to diners and bowling and movies. 
He went to the Bowery, looked for drunk, and used. The meetings, by the way, were late. In Brooklyn, there's a Sheep's Head Bakery. Their meeting on a Friday night starts at 9 o'clock. You don't see a lot of meetings starting that late. And the, back then, the meetings were late. You know why? Because they meet an hour or two before, get together, have coffee, talk, then they have a meeting. By the time the meeting ends, it was 10, 10.30, hang out a little, it's time to go home. Now we got to get in and out. The meeting's at 7 o'clock, out by 8, got a whole night. Let's get into trouble. And they knew that. These guys and these men and women were shaky. So let's make this a whole event, a once a week entire event. And tomorrow we're taking a couple and go get a new one at the detox or the hospital. We'll go right down to the Bowery and clean one up. So I got to do on that my first 12 step call years ago. I was new. And we took this guy to Coney Island Hospital in Brooklyn. I'll never forget this. And it was an old time of driving. And this guy was getting sick in the back of the car. And I was petrified. And we dropped him off at Coney Island Hospital in Brooklyn. And the next morning I went to work. And this guy, we'll call him Joe, was on the corner panhandling. The very next morning. And I thought I did something wrong when I called my sponsor. And my sponsor said, did you stay sober through that 12-step call? Then you did okay. Were you willing to work with that guy to sponsor him? Yeah, he said, you did okay. And that's what we're responsible, carrying the message, not the mess. Now, I'm going to maybe ruffle some feathers. A lot of us are carrying the mess and not a message. You know, we're telling a hardcore alcohol, don't drink, go to meetings. That kills people. Make 90 meetings in 90 days. That drunk is in a state of obsession. That's not going to work. 90 meetings in 90 days is nothing. Giving a drunk my phone number, they're going to file it unless they need money. Then they'll call you. Right? And the way I was brought up in Alcoholics Anonymous, when a drunk came in the door and was rock and roll and needed some help, I'm not going to call the wife. I'm going to be home late. I got a drunk. We're going to work with him. We got a couple of guys. We're going to circle the wagons. We're going to take them for a cup of coffee. We're going to work with them tonight. Be home late. And that's what they did. You know why? Because my life, my survival is dependent upon working with other people. Now, treatment centers have destroyed that to some degree. Because people get well in treatment centers. Thank God we have them. But the desire, like these two women, uh, you don't see in a lot of folks. They get well, the wrinkles are out of our belly, and we're going to go to diner, hang out, go to the beach, we're going to go to a club, we're going to go to a topless drum, we're going to do this, oh, and then I'll go to a meeting right along. Or we'll meet at the meeting for a social event, it's all about us, and we get, because we're more important about where we're going afterwards. And back then it was a little different. This was an event. This was an event. This was, this was our bloodline. And we treated as such. And I've been able to have the privilege and the honor of doing many, many 12-step calls over the years, which a lot of times they've gone away because people go to detox and treatment. Thank God we have those avenues to take people to. But it was a little different. Even when I was coming up, 12-step calls were a regular occurrence. And once you got, you kind of, you, you weren't wet behind the ears anymore. Was it a thing to do? We're going on a 12-step call, bring in the cavalry, get three, four guys to go get the drunk, pull them out of the house, clean them up. I cleaned up lots of drunks. And I got sober in 1988. I'm not like around from the 40s or 50s when this they were doing all the time. And I remember the first drunk I had to clean up. It was throwing up and it was dirty. I had to clean him up. You know, I was getting sick doing it. And part of me would say, why am I doing this? This is crazy. I'm still here. And then it shifted. I get to do God's work. Who else is going to do it? Who else is going to clean up a drunk? The cops are going to throw you in jail. They don't care. The detox, the detox can kick you out. If you don't have insurance, you're not getting in. They don't care. It's a business. We do. We care. Because we see ourselves in, 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 in the addict alcoholic who's dropping dead, who's puking, who's going through withdrawal. And only we know what that feels like. In the big book, it says, uh, we lo know loneliness such as few do. We know what it's like being in there. Where the kids are not talking, your wife or husband wants no part of you, and we're left, us and the jug, and now what? We know what that's like. We know what the bottom of the hole feels like. We have more empathy and sympathy for a drunk, and we will work with them. And that's what I did. Interesting thing about 12-step calls, see where your spiritual condition is. I've had to throw liquor down the, down the waste pipe, uh, the sink, pills, works, cookers, paper, powder, you name it. I've been in front of all of it on 12-step calls, lots of it even at times. And it would go down the toilet, the pills would go down, the syringes we'd wrap up, the cookies we'd throw out, 
and I don't mean to bring break singleness of purpose, but I just want to give you a, an idea of what I've, I've, I've been able to do. And the bottles, we just, like this, down the sink, and throw the bottles out. And God be my witness, not one time did I want to jump in the sink after the liquor, or jump down the toilet after the pills. In a position of neutrality, safe and protected, because my focus was God's work, getting that drunk well, we got rid of the poison first. Now, they were going, don't do that, please, just save one for me, you know. Just one little taste before I go to die. I am going to detox, how about, you know. And there's been times on 12 step calls, I remember the first time we had to do this, there was a, his name was Sal, I'll never forget it. We had to basically break into his basement, per his mother. She says, go get my son, he's dying. If you got to break in, break in. The four, four of us went. And uh, we he had to, he was barricaded in, we broke in, and he had sores all over his body. He was just nasty. And uh, his, he had a beautiful home that his mom lived in. He was living in the basement. His beautiful home was a dungeon. She couldn't reach him anymore. And he was in his 40s at the time. I'm still in, like, you know, my early 30s. This is new. I'm, I'm green to this. He was filthy and full of sores. Now, we had to take a pint with us and feed him on the way to the hospital. We went to Lutheran Hospital. I'll never forget, we dropped him off in Brooklyn. And every so often, that's how we bait him. We'll give you a couple of swigs, but you're going, okay, I'll go. And, and right before we went, he took a couple of gulps. And sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes on a 12 step call, you got to buy a bottle for the drunk. If not, they're going to go into DTs. Now, we don't buy, we don't buy substances because they're illegal. So we're not going to do that. But we'll get them drunk. Uh, not drunk, we'll get them from getting sick. I, I remember the first time my sponsor gave me 20 bucks. He's going to look to store, get this guy a pint. I said, how many good people? And they ain't going to see me. Like, oh <laughs> it's not for me. It's for the drunk in the car. You know. I, and I was thinking of that. And I bought a pint, and we cracked the seal. Here, take a couple of pops and give it back. You had to do that. Now, I'm an alcoholic. The real art book on page 21, I lived for the next drink. My mouth was not watering. I wasn't looking at him. So I'd love to take a little pop. It was like poison. But we had to do that. And our book talks about nursing a drunk through the night, sitting with the drunk. And then we were able to counsel families, by the way, because the families need help. They don't know about al -Anon. So I call up Tammy. I say, Tammy, listen, we got a family here. you got to take them to al -Anon. Tammy comes and brings them to al -Anon. And if there are no Alans, we'll take them. Or at least counsel with the family. Even though the drunk gets out, our book talks about working with the families. <clears throat> now, we don't break confidence. We don't give up the drunk to the family. I can't tell you how many times I did a 12-step call, and I come back into the living room, and the family goes, what did he say? Did he tell you about the time? And I, you know, you got to protect that. But at least we can counsel the families, even though the drunk is drinking again. It's a huge responsibility. God has basically given us the torch. Say, here, go fix my children. Go help my children. And there's just much work for us to do with Al-Anon as there is an alcoholic synonymous because every drunk has a family, and the families are just as sick as the alcoholic, and they're innocent bystanders that are involved in a drive-by. Now, they may want, not want to go to Al-Anon, they may not want to go to therapy, but at least we offer them our books as this way of life. We have that responsibility. And if they take it, they take it. If not, it's okay. But we always keep a door open for the families because usually it's the family who's going to call us about the drunk, not the drunk calling us, come help, come help me. That's when the drunk completely bottoms out. And there's nowhere else, nowhere else to go. So God's given us a tremendous responsibility. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, what message am I passing out? In the third edition... The big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, it says, but the basic text pages 1 to 164 have remained unchanged. This is the AA message. I'll say that again. But the basic text, pages 1 to 164, have remained unchanged. This is the AA message. That's in the third edition. I don't know what happened in the fourth edition. I don't know if they put it back in or not. I'm not a fan of the fourth edition. That's just for me. But the third edition, that's what it has on the little fly page. This is the AA message. So what message is my home group conveying? What message am I conveying to another drunk? If I'm in here a few years and all I got to offer is don't drink and go to meetings, okay, great, that's your business, but shouldn't I have more to offer? If I'm in AA six months, shouldn't I have more to offer? If I'm in AA for 90 days, shouldn't I have more to offer? If I'm in AA 
60 days, 30 days. Shouldn't I have more to offer? I do if I have a sponsor who's moving me through the work. We have some of our meetings on getting on a soapbox here. Get a sponsor with the year or more sobriety. Where in a big, big book of Alcoholics Anonymous does it say get a sponsor with a year or more sobriety? When they wrote this, no one had a year. Bill had six months when he got to uh, a Dr. Bob. Ebby had not even 90 days when he got to Bill. He was out of the Oxford group. Where did this come? Get a sponsor with a year or more sobriety. Have you seen some of the people with a year or more sobriety? <laughs> very pompous and arrogant of me, I apologize. <laughs> These guys were catching fire immediately and what they were doing was going to get a drunk to share the spiritual transformation and you were sponsored into a group. Now that has its good points and bad points, but that's what sponsors by Sp I vouch for you. I'm vouching for Michael. He's one of us. I sat with the family. I sat with him. We take them upstairs. You ready to turn everything over to your life over to God? Yes. We do third step prayer together. Bring them in inventory. There's no such thing as 90 meetings in 90 days. We have Academy Awards for coins, which was done very nicely tonight. But you go to some meetings, it's a four-hour meeting because Joe's going to tell his entire life story. <laughs> and the sponsor wants the spotlights. It's another two-hour story. And four hours later, we celebrated one anniversary. They didn't have that. The old time used to tell me, you want a coin for something you should have been doing all along. How self-centered are you? And that's the way I was brought up. Maybe it's a little hard line for touchy-feely, but AA, hey, hey, but that's just the way it is. I'm here now. So it says, practice these principles in all our affairs. Carry this message. Practice these principles. What message am I carrying? What principles am I practicing? Hopefully I have more principles than affairs, right? <laughs> in our big book it says our homes, occupations and affairs take this into our homes, occupations and affairs so we're acutely aware of what it's like to work with a drunk in here being spiritual in here looking for the newcomer You know, we ask who's, who's available for sponsorship and we have step meetings and workshops and things like that and we meet here we come together with a common problem and hopefully we have the common solution to offer. But what happens when we leave here? Am I an AA angel and a house devil? Taking these principles home is just as important as looking like Moses in AA meeting. How am I doing when I'm home? How am I with the wife? Am I practicing fidelity in my relationship? Or has that been tainted while I'm sober? Do I have fidelity in my relationship with God? Or is that just when I'm in trouble? What sort of principles am I taking home? Am I taking this message home into my occupations? That means my job. What kind of worker am I? How am I doing on the job? Would my coworkers say I'm good to work with? I'm responsible. I'm diligent in all my duties. How am I doing? And my affairs, my social life, what's that look like? Do I look like a drunken cell when I'm out with the guys at a diner trying to pick up waitresses and acting like I'm in Atlantic City or Las Vegas? Or am I a gentleman? We have a social life in AA. I see the new girl walking in, and I have eyes for her. Am I trying to scoop her up? How's that? I see a lot of that. And a woman are just as guilty. How's that looking? Practicing these principles in all my affairs. Home, occupation, affairs. So I have a responsibility. Now, what's really interesting, once we wake up, as a, bless you, as a result of these steps, the same way I was driven to go use, we're moved to go carry this message. We're moved to uh, live in the sunlight of the Spirit. That the things I used to get away with, I can no longer get away with because the road begins to narrow as I wake up. I see a wet drunk walking in. I can't go home right away. i got to get that drunk. I have to go work with them. Because their life was dependent upon one of ours. A huge responsibility God has given us. And here, go take care of my children. Bring them back, the lost sheep, bring them back to the herd because they're going to die. And he could have gave this, we read this at the end of the meeting, he could have gave this message to anyone, great minds of our time. He gave it to another drunk because we speak each other's language. Another responsibility to have, and I speak for myself, if I got a hardcore dope fiend who's not an alky, my job is to get him to another fellowship or her to another fellowship, take him to open AA meetings. But identification is key. 
I remember going to AA, and uh, guys who were addicted with crack say, I know this is AA, but drugs are part of my story. And they would talk about crack cocaine. I never smoked crack cocaine. And I'm sitting in AA, but I have no idea what they're talking about. I have no idea what the sex spree is on a, on a crack. I don't get that. A good sponsor would teach them and take them to their kind. That's all part of sponsorship. It's a huge responsibility and a privilege that God has allowed us to do to go fix his children. Who else is going to work with us? Even if we go to treatment, even if we're in treatment, like I was institutionalized for almost 11 months, eventually we get out. And then who's going to pick us up? Us. What are we doing? What kind of message are we carrying? God has given us a tremendous amount of power and responsibility to go fix his children. We're no longer powerless once we go through the steps. The belief system in some contemporary AA is I'm always going to be powerless. I'm powerless. I'm powerless. Not according to my big book. Not according to countless others. We get great power, God's power, to go work with his kids. And I speak from my lineage, I'd better be offering more than don't drink and go to meetings. Make 90 meetings in 90 days. Put the plug in the jug. The plug in it. I thought it came out. I, that's, I took the plug out, I cracked the can of beer, I twisted the cork off. I'm going to no plugs going in my jug. I'm drinking until it's over and I go pan out and get more. That I identify with. When you discover a prospect for alcohol synonymous, find out all you can about him. If he or she does not want to stop drinking, don't waste time trying to persuade them. Ouch. <coughs> don't waste time trying to persuade them. My sponsors always told me, you can't get in the way of someone's bottom. What made me teachable? My bottom? I had to hit my bottom. Everyone has different plateaus, Park Avenue, Park Bench. You may spoil a later opportunity. This advice is given for his family also. They should be patient and realize they're dealing with the sick person. If there's any indication that they want to stop, have a good talk with the person most interested, usually his wife or the husband, sometimes mom or dad, depending on how old they are. And they will give you the real deal, exactly what's going on. So the drunk will say, like I do, oh, it's not that bad. I got into a little trouble. And, the, and the, the wife will say, he spent all our money, sold all the jewelry, beats me up. They'll get, they'll get the real deal from the family. Get an idea of their behavior, their problems, background, seriousness of their condition, religious leanings. You need this information to put yourself in their place to see how you would like to be approached if the tables were turned. Then my book says, sometimes it's wise to wait for that drunk to go on another binge or a run. They need to become teachable like I did. Not a day shy, not a day later. But we're always there. Now, what if you're working with the drunk and uh, they're sober and they're coming along here and suddenly they go out? Does that mean we give up on them and they come back and go out again? Absolutely not. Maybe we can't sponsor them, but we never give up hope. We always stand at the door. Uh, I forget the gentleman's name who wrote a poem about AA. I stand by the door. We stand by the door waiting for them to come back, even if we have to go 12-step them, and we counsel the family. But that's what we do. We keep the light on, and we work with them. What if someone would have gave up on these two young ladies if AA wasn't here for them? We'd be going to have a funeral service for both of them, but the door was open. People were here, and they make a year, and they're going to go work with others. A life is born again. Lives are born again because of the power God has given us in Alcoholics Anonymous. Huh? So when I first came around to Alcoholics Anonymous and I was brought to the Free Spirit Group, this gentleman, uh, uh, Tony was his name, I asked him to sponsor me. And he had me read the first 164 pages of the book. And he asked me those three questions and we began a journey right from the cover of the book. And methodically we went through the steps. And the way I was brought up in sponsorship, and it's, it's, I do it now, Wednesday nights I'm on the phone with my sponsor, I have a date and time to call. This guy would have me call him. And we would have to meet at a meeting. And we'd sit down and we'd go through the steps. We'd go in the back of the kitchen and we would, we would do step work. And he told me about being a greeter and giving service and do 12 step calls. Tremendous stuff we get to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. On page 164,
It says this, but it will not have the benefit of contact with you who write this book. We, can, we cannot be sure. God will determine that, so you must remember that your reliance is always upon God. He will show you how to create the fellowship you crave. A book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation, watch this, what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. Not give me a relationship, I need a new car, I need a new cell phone, which has seemed to be a primary purpose lately in AA. The answers will come if your house is in order. Is my house in order? Am I up to date on amends? Do I have a sponsor? Am I getting well? Do I take meetings into detoxes and prisons? If I'm asked to speak, do I say yes? Do you need a coffee maker? Am I volunteering? But obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't gotten. Sometimes we will, what we do, and that's untreated alcoholism. Six sponsors, six sponsee. Well sponsored, usually a well sponsee. See to it that your relationship with God is right and great events will come to pass for you and countless others, which means this awakened spirit will touch the lives of others. The same way I infected other people when I was sick and suffering. This is the great fact to us, for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely what, of what you have and join us. We, will shall, we shall be with you in the fellowship of the spirit and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. In spirit, those founding members are walking with us. What a great piece of literature as to what I get to do. Twelve-step calls, which I like to just talk about for a few minutes. Um, we don't do a lot of them. I don't hear a lot of them, because we, especially down here, there's a treatment center. You throw a rock and hit 40 treatment centers and 100 halfway houses. Okay. And they've helped. They've helped. They, they, they try to do well. But even when I was coming in at 1988, we did a lot of 12-step calls. We never do a 12-step call alone. The men go get the men. The women go get the women. And if I'm a guy gets a call from a drunk and she's a woman, I'll call up a couple of ladies and say, hey, got someone here's your dress, go get her. Maybe I'll go with them if it's a bad neighbor, but they're going to go in. They're going to go work with them. Because it can be very, very sticky if you try to 12-step a woman and you're a guy, it can get a little funky. And vice versa. Right? So the men go get the men, the women go get the women, and you never go alone. You take someone with you. Now, I remember doing 12-step calls, and I was taught, because I didn't know better. We'd go a few guys in, and maybe the guy was an attorney. So we get someone who had an education. None of my friends had education. We had to call up Michael to go with us. You know? <laughs> so you get someone who can talk their language. Someone who's got an education, can relate, they can talk, and he'll take the lead, we'll be the backup. Maybe it's a blue-collar guy who never went to school. We get that guy to do the lunch, to do the talking, and we stay in the background, and we go in. Now when you're doing a call on a drunk, you've never been in the house before. Intergroup calls, hey, can you go to this address? we got a drunk, the family just called. You knock on the door, and there's the drunk. One goes in the kitchen, make sure there's no sharp objects or weapons in the house. If it's a hotel room, when I first got down here, we did this. I took three guys. This guy was in a hotel room up in Pompano. So I had one of the guys talk to the drunk who was basically flat out on his back. And we checked closets. We checked the bathroom because I don't know who's in there. Even looked under the bed, but the bed had that little bowl. There was no, no, nothing, nothing underneath. We, should, we scope out the place because you don't know what you're walking into. And on the way into this hotel, I told the front desk, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, so are these men, we got a drunk in there who's in serious trouble, we need to go in. I gave him my ID, everything was on board. In case the police do show up and there's narcotics in there, we, we've covered our rear end. And the hotels are usually very obliging when you tell them you got a drunk in there, I might die then, go get him. <laughs> now some drunks go willingly, usually in tears, some drunks might get violent. And if they do get violent, you call 911 and let the police take it. They'll take them to a tank, dry them out, and we'll get them the next day. It's okay to do that. So I've done calls like that, gone into a hotel, never alone. I've always gone with someone, gone into the house, and the, the, the wife would say, he's back there. 
and she's really angry. And the kids are looking at you like, what's going on in our house? Who are these strangers coming in? And usually the family would always tell me this, what did they say? I don't tell them. Did he tell you about the time he did this? I don't say anything. My job is to get that drunk who's bleeding to death to a detox, to a treatment center, or to an AA meeting. Another thing we don't see often is you'd have a jug and the drunk would start to get funky. You take him outside, give him a couple of shots and bring him back into a meeting to stop the shaking and for him to go into DTs. I had twice, I had to go around the clock, sit through the night, my sponsor and I with this guy. And he would feed him some liquor and we piled out for the night with this drunk. He never got sober, by the way. But what an experience to do. I was petrified by it. I was scared to death. I had no idea what I was doing. But I relied upon the elders to teach me how to do that stuff. It's truly God's work that we get to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. Now the message we're carrying, whether it's our homes, occupations, affairs to another drunk, or what we're doing in here, is usually a result of the 12 steps. What message am I carrying? i got a huge responsibility as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous to carry this message in the big book Alcoholics Anonymous so people can celebrate a year, two years, three years. What if we told these two young ladies just don't drink and go to meetings? They're dead. What if we told Greg, just put the plug in the jug, Greg, you're fine. I'm dead. No, I'm not <laughs> We're dead. But those three folks, I know the message they got. And sometimes we slammed it home to them, but they were teachable. Alcohol beat them into a state of reasonableness. And sometimes you got to wrinkle up the drunk a little. you got to greet them the right act. you got, you got to come at them. You can't be touchy-feely all the time. Because they're dying, they don't know better. We have a responsibility. Sponsorship is key as to what we do. Carrying this message one drunk to another. <clears throat> Real quick. AA started, and I obviously wasn't there, but when we study comes of age, we study our history, we learn about this stuff. We need to touch our history. After the Saturday evening post that Jack Alexander uh, put out, there was an influx of AAs. Phone calls, telegrams, letters, you guys got the cure, there's a drunk here, there's a drunk here, there's a drunk here. They were coming in by the droves to get what they called the cure. We didn't have enough people to sponsor. What are we going to do? And Clarence Snyder formalizes how we're going to work with these people. How do we take these people? To, how do we take three and four? How did Dr. Bob sponsor over 5,000 people quickly and efficiently and get them to go work with others? There was no time for the drunk to hang around for nine months before a step a year. Everyone was dying on that. They had to get the message, have a transformation. Let's go to detox and get another one. Bill was in New Jersey for a while. And Bill and a bunch of others, what they would do is they'd get in the car and they'd go from hospital to hospital. You got a drunk, got a drunk, got a drunk. That's what they did all day long, looking for drunks. When Bill was in uh, 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 Ohio with, with Dr. Bob, they would go to Yachtman City Hospital. You got any drunks? Okay, we'll go to the got any drunks. Uh, uh, Bill and Bob were going right down to the Bowery and taking drunks in off the street into Dr. Bob's kitchen and trying to get them sober. It was a flying blind period. And it's a great story. Bill's doing this almost six months and no one's getting sober. He got to tweak his approach a little bit. And a lot of us know the story. He came home and he tells Lois, bless her heart, this is not working. I can't get anyone sober. And she said something like, but Bill, you're still sober. And a light bulb went off, working with others ensures my sobriety. And he went out looking for more. That's what we do. We don't need a girlfriend. We don't need a boyfriend. We don't need a raise. We don't need a new car. We need a drunk in front of me. A drunken, dirty, smelling drunk. So that's the responsibility we have to do, and uh, I've exceeded the time. So that's all I got. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.